Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. There's a lot of people in this room right now. I gotta be loud. Um, So my name's Keith, if you didn't get that from all the people saying my name. Um, So, and I'm up here, we're gonna be doing a little lesson this morning. Are you guys excited? Come on. Ready? Yeah, Yeah, that was a lot of fake (laughs) yes. Anyways, so good news today. We're kicking it old school. I just put the titles of the scriptures up there, so we'll actually have to read our Bibles! Oh no! Also, if you want a Bible, I have three up here, and my wife will gladly give you one if you want to flip through it. (laughs) Sweet. Anyway, so I'm I'm excited to be up here to share a little bit with you guys this morning. This morning we're going to be continuing our journey through the book of Luke. So, last week, if you were with us, Nick gave us a lesson on Luke chapter 15. So naturally, today we're going to be looking at Luke, Luke 16. What? Am I right? Because... Oh, well, that's what we're doing. <laughs> I don't care. Um, anyways, last week Nick talked about how much God loves us. You know, how much he pursues us. He wants that relationship with us. And that really is quite amazing. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Come on. Right? This morning we're going to be looking at Luke 16... And kind of go in, similarly to what Nick talked about last week, about how God loves and pursues us. What we're going to talk about today is how we need to love and pursue God as well as others. Amen? Amen. The title of my lesson this morning is Living Outward. I was trying to figure out, should I write Living Outwardly? Living, I just went with Living Outward. That's what we're talking about today. And what I wanted to talk about is how we can live our lives for God, how we can live our lives for others, and how we can strive to be selfless in that matter. So as I normally do, we're going to talk about three things this morning. Come on, three points. Three things, three points. First thing we're going to talk about is living for God. We'll follow that up talking about living for others, and we'll close out with our favorite topic about living in humility. Amen? Come on. All right. All right, but before we jump in this morning, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear God in heaven, just want to come before you this morning. God, just thank you so much for bringing us here together to worship you, to sing to you. God, just to be able to be here to learn a little bit about you this morning and to fellowship with each other. God, I pray that you can be with us this morning and just open up our hearts, open up our minds. God, help us to be humble this morning to your word. I pray that you can just really be with the rest of this lesson, just be with the rest of our days. And I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All righty. So first thing we're going to talk about is living for God. You can turn your Bibles or click on the scripture on your phone to <laughs> Luke 16. We'll be there in just a minute. But we're talking about living for God. And like Nick talked about last week, God is pursuing us and we need to strive to pursue him as well. It can't just be a one-way relationship. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a one-way relationship. It's usually, they usually don't work out very well. Um, So we're going to read this parable in Luke 16, and it's the parable of the shrewd manager. I don't know if you've read it before, but if you have, you're probably like, what is going (laughs) on? And I'm not going to lie, I'm still kind of like, what is going on? But we'll, we'll talk about this, we'll figure it out together, amen? Come on. So Luke 16, we'll actually be reading 1 through 12. We'll pick it up in verse 1, it says, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. You know what? I know what I'll do so that when I I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each each one of his master's debtors and he asked him the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. 
For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. You know what, we'll stop right there. We'll read the rest in a little bit. So this is an interesting parable, right? You know, at face value, I'm like, why is this in the Bible? (laughs) Because, you know, this guy, he lied. He cheated. He stole from his manager. He just made some stuff up all for selfish gain. You're like, and then he was commended. Hey, good job, buddy. Like, that was cool. (laughs) You're like, why? What's going on here? Doesn't really make sense. But there's a couple points I want to make from this. And the first point, going from my first point, is living. We've got to be living for God, mm-hmm. right? So when we look at this parable, we see this man, though he was dishonest and he was selfish, trying to get himself out of the hole, he did act shrewdly. You know, he put in that time, he was diligent, and he did everything that he could within his own power to get himself out of the hole that he had put himself in, Right? What the manager did in this parable is probably what a normal worldly person would do. Anything that I can do to make sure that I'm taken care of because, man, I'm going to be in a bad situation if things aren't taken care of after this, right? And honestly, I think we often do things like this as well, you know, get, trying to get stuff for ourselves. But one of, one of the points I think Jesus is making here, and he talks about it in verse 8, is the master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. And so the the manager, you know, he worked hard. He pushed himself to get money or to get whatever he needed. And what Jesus is talking about here is if people of the light, Christians, disciples, worked as hard, pushed themselves as much, put as much energy into God as people of the world put as much energy, energy into worldly stuff, we would be much better disciples, much better Christians, much better people, right? Kind of giving that, that correlation there. You know, if we even put some of the energy that we pour into getting money, into getting relationships, getting that house, or whatever it may be, and pointed it towards God, that would help us be so much more effective for him. Amen? And, you know, the Bible, the whole thing is about calling us to live for God. You know, there's so many scriptures in the Bible that talk about living for God. This isn't the only part of the Bible where it's like, hey, you got to come out, you have to go after me. One very common one, Matthew 6, 33 through 34. If you want to flip there, you don't have to. I'll just read it to you. It says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. All the worldly things that you need, I'll take care of that. You just seek first after me. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. Amen? Another scripture is in Colossians 3, another scripture I really like, talking about living for God. Okay. I actually have to flip there, this is nice. Oh man. Uh oh, this is hard. I see the book, it's all good. Alrighty. So Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord, as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Amen? Talking about living for God here. You know, we could go on throughout the whole Bible and just quote scriptures about how, hey, we need to be going after Jesus, going after God, living for God. And I think the reason why there are so many scriptures to remind us who we need to be living for is because we so easily forget who we need to be living for, right? It's so easy just to get distracted. You know, you get stressed out. Finals are coming up. Oh no, for all the students in the room, I know what it's like. You kind of forget about God and you're like, oh, engineering is more important right now or nursing is more important right now, whatever it may be. You got deadlines at work. You're, you got to fit. You got to build a dining room table by Thanksgiving. I don't know what it might be. Weird it happens to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's a real common one. You know, we can so often be like the shrewd manager and push ourselves for worldly things, right? Instead of pushing ourselves for God. The question is, 
that I have for you this morning is what are you living for? What are you living for? Are you living for God and pouring your energy into him? You know, whatever you do, working for, as if you're working for the Lord. Or are you living for this world and living for yourself? And these are important things to think about because it really is easy to get distracted. You know, none of us here are above getting distracted by stuff. I'm not above it. Nick's not above it. Evan's definitely not above it. <laughs> I'm just kidding, kidding. But, you know, we're not above it, right? We've got to yeah. really be real with ourselves. Like, what, am, like what, do, what do my actions show? You know, because you can be like, oh, yeah, of course. But then, you know, you're going off doing whatever you want, right? This is something that we really got to think about it. And this is why we got to be living outwardly, amen? Living for God, living outwardly. The next thing we'll talk about is living for others. Let's go back to Luke 16. Living for others. So we talked about living for God, now we're going to talk about living for others. So the thing about living for God and not worldly things doesn't mean that we don't live, that we don't go get worldly things. It, what, what it does mean, though, is we have to know what to do with the worldly things we obtain, if that makes sense. Um, let's, read, let's, let's pick this up again, Luke 16, verse 9. So, the master just commended the dishonest manager, and he says, I, and then Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. So that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? And we'll stop right there. So this scripture, Jesus says, hey, it's not wrong to have stuff. It's not wrong to have worldly possessions. He doesn't want us to go and live on the streets and just preach to people and not have anything. He wants you to have stuff so that you can have something to give to others, right? And the more you have and the more you give, the more he will give you so that you can give more, right? The less you have, and you keep, the, the more you keep for yourself, the less you're going to give, right? I don't know if that made any sense, but <laughs> we're going a different direction than that. So the point is we have to use what we have to love and to serve others. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Okay. We'll be there in a minute. You know, there, there are a lot of great examples of using our stuff, our possessions to give to others. You know, even in this room, I think of, I, I could think of each and every one of you guys, but I think of Matt and Bonnie always using their house for a party, for Thanksgiving, having people over, Super Bowl party, whatever. They're always ready and willing to yeah. open that out, open that up to give. I think about fried rice, Fred and Bryce. <laughs> um, even though they just got married seven weeks ago, they've probably had everybody in this room over for dinner. I think, about. probably. They're getting there. They're working through it. And that's hard to do, especially right after you get married. You don't want to have anybody over. <laughs> At least I didn't. Anyways, <laughs> you know, and just going out there, having people over, serving them, just reaching out to others, too. It's really cool. You know, so there's great examples in this room. There's great examples in the Bible. Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. So I have a little analogy for you, a little um, scenario here, just to preface this scripture. So, um, Acts chapter 2, a big, big, big uh, chapter on um, the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming down. But let's just, let's put it into perspective here. So, let's say our church here in Fairbanks has 120 disciples. We're, we fill up this room. And there's a huge conference going on in Fairbanks. People from all over the world coming to Fairbanks to hear about God and stuff. And most of these people aren't, aren't Christians. And so Nick's speaking at this conference. And Nick goes out there, man, and he does the best lesson 
ever. So good, so amazing that 3,000 of these people are like, you know what, I want to become a Christian. 3,000 people get baptized, and 3,000 people become disciples that day. Nick's like feeling pretty good about himself. Awesome. <laughs> Anyways, but then we're like, wait a minute. These 3,000 people, they're from all over the place. And they're like, wait a minute, Fairbanks is where it's at. This is where the Holy Spirit is. This is where I'm going to stay. So now we got 3,000 people <laughs> here in Fairbanks. Just, they're, they're, they're just staying, and they're staying with us because, you know, Nick did such a good job. That's 3,000 baby disciples, 3,000 people who don't have a place to live, and 3,000 people who need to be fed. Oh, my goodness. That's a logistical nightmare. Nick's like, why did I, ha why did I preach such a good lesson? Oh, I should have, oh, dang it. You know? <laughs> should have brought it down a step, right? Anyways, but like that's very similar to the situation these guys were in. It was the day of Pentecost. People from all over the, the Mediterranean were in Jerusalem to like worship God. And a lot of them didn't speak the same language, but then... 3,000 of them became disciples, and they're like, hey, we're going to stay here because this is where it's at. And then, So let's pick it up in Acts 2, verse 44. Let's see what they did with this logistical nightmare. <laughs> verse 44, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. That's not how I would have been, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh, but you, you read this. These guys were completely selfless. They gave to everyone who had need. They sold their stuff. What? I'm not selling my stuff, right? They sold their stuff so that they could give to all these people who, were, who just showed up, yeah. right? They ate together and they were happy about it. <laughs> Sometimes that's really hard, especially when you, you, you're giving them all your stuff any, already, right? Yeah. But they were happy about it. It's super amazing. What happened when they did all this? God added to their number daily, right? They were taken care of, too. And God added to their number daily those who were being saved, right? They grew. They had more people to take care of, right? <laughs> it didn't stop there. Um, but the amazing thing about this is the people in this story weren't living for themselves. Right? right? They were living for each other yeah. like, like crazy, selling th th their stuff to give to each other. You know, first of all, they were living for God, and then they were living for others. Yeah. And not only that, they were happy about it. They were glad. They were like, this is awesome. Yeah. This is a good time. The question that I have for you is, what are you using your stuff for? What are you using what God has given you for? Are you using what you have to give to others? Giving to and living for others? Or are you using it all for yourself? And this is tough to think about because it's, man, I really like just holing up in my house for a solid couple days and not doing anything, brewing beer, and just having maybe one or two guys, one or two of you that I like over, you know? <laughs> no, I like all you guys, but I'm just saying, like, that's what it's easy to think, right? Yeah, come on. These are important things to think about because we've got to be giving to God, giving to others. But there's one thing that all of this takes. That's what we're going to close out this morning talking about, and that is humility. <clears throat> it takes a lot of humility to live for God, and it takes a lot of humility to live for others. Amen? Yeah. So last thing we'll talk about is living in humility. Let's flip back to Luke chapter 16. We'll finish up there, the chapter there in a minute. But living in humility, is, it's easier said than done, right? Be like, oh, yeah, oh, humility, that's cool. But when it comes down to actually being humble, it's super hard because it takes a lot of selflessness. And the opposite is also true. Pride comes along with a lot of selfish, selfishness 
and living for ourselves, right? So we'll talk a little bit about humility and pride. But we're going to finish up this chapter here. It's got a good story about this. We'll be in Luke 16, verse 19. Okay. Talking about the rich man and Lazarus. Here, let me... That's what we'll be reading. Verse 19. Okay. It says, There was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate he was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell off from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell where, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And beside, besides all this, between us, you, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone raises from the dead. Wow. So this is a pretty crazy story. You know, we got the rich man and Lazarus, you know, and they kind of switch places after they die, right? The rich man lived for himself, had everything he had. The beggar lived outside. And then there's a lot we can draw from this story. You know, it gives us a really clear picture of what happens when we don't use our worldly wealth for good, right? Yeah. Kind of a bummer there. Yeah. But what I want to talk about are the last few verses here. You know, the rich man begs Abraham to let Lazarus raise from the dead and go and tell his brothers. This please, like, go tell them because, you know, I can't get over there. This is a really horrible place. I don't want my family to come here to. Go and tell them that, hey... It's going to really suck if you don't fix this thing going on, right? Yeah. But what does Abraham tell him? Yeah. Not even someone raising from the dead will change their minds. Not even someone raising, raising from the dead will lead them to repentance because they didn't believe what the Bible taught, what their Bible was, the Moses and the prophets, right? That's what pride can do to you. Yeah. It can blind you from what you need to know, what you need to be repenting from. It can blind you from listening to what the Bible teaches. And it can blind you even from being impacted by miracles. You yeah. see the Pharisees throughout the whole Bible. People were raising from the dead, and they were like, who is this guy? We hate him. He's like, he must be from Satan or something, right? They, they just found excuses. Yeah. Now, I don't know what you think, but that's pretty scary because yeah. pride blinds. And so when you're blind, you don't know what's going on, right? Yeah. Because I think we all can easily struggle with pride. You know, and I'm not talking the outward, cocky, loud kind of pride, but I'm talking about self-righteous. I know what I know, and no one but God can change my mind about that, right? That, that kind of pride. You know, the, fair, the pride the Pharisees had. You know, they grew up going to church. Sound familiar? You know, they grew up reading the Bible. Does that sound familiar? They knew what they knew because they grew up in it, and their parents taught them what they should know, right? Yeah. They knew. And that's scary to me because that's, that's me. My dad's a preacher man, you know? <laughs> you know, they had the kind of pride that hardens Pride can harden our heart from seeing anything but what we want to see, yeah. right? We all got to be aware of this because, you know, I think we're, 
we, we can be like this sometimes. I know I can be unwilling to listen, unwilling to face myself when I know something's wrong. Unwilling to seek help, thinking, you know, I'm, I'm okay when I'm clearly not, right? When we're like this, we're, it's super destructive. You know, we break up relationships with, with people. It causes bitterness. It causes problems. It's no fun. Nobody likes to hang out with a super prideful person. But the opposite is also true, right? When someone's humble, living in humility, it's constructive. You know, it builds relationships. It brings us closer to God, and it ultimately benefits us more, right? Yeah. Even though it's much harder to practice. It's easy to be prideful. It's easy to close down, right? Yeah. Who here has ever spent some time with someone who's just super humble? Who really just wants to learn from me? He's just like, oh, man, I just want to know what you know. I want to, how do you do this? This is really cool. Hey, just someone who's really humble. How does it feel when you hang out with them? Pretty awesome, right? Hey, I want to go hang out with, I want to hang out with this guy because he's, he likes me. You know, he listens to what I have to say. You know, it's just a good time. You know, last year in October, so I grew up in Canada and I grew up in a church in Edmonton. And last year in October, I went back to that church in Edmonton. Um, and she, my wife and I went back there and it was one of the most amazing times because the church there was so humble. You know, these were people who babysat me. These were people who <laughs> led my little preteen church classes. These were people who, who knew me when I was like 10 to 14, right? And they were here, they were seeking, they're, they're like people twice my age, seeking advice from me. And I'm like, wait a minute. It should be this way, right? It, it should be swapped. But it, it yeah. felt really good. It was like, yeah. man, you know what? I'll go back to Edmonton. Those guys are awesome. You know what? They, they like asked me questions. And I was like, you know what? I don't know. You, you should know that. <laughs> you know, but it was just an awesome time. And just to be humble to someone, like just being in their position, I'm like, you knew me when I was like a kid and you're asking me questions? That's, that's crazy humility to me. Because yeah. like, I, I think about someone I babysat and I'm like, whatever, bro. Like, I'm like, <laughs> you know? But it's amazing to see the humility, even l willing to learn willing to learn from someone they, they, that you rose. That's just crazy. Yeah. It's so impactful. You know, it really strengthens relationships. I want to go back to Edmonton, you know. Those friendships and set a great example about how I can live. You know, it, I learned that no matter how much younger, different, or whatever, we can still learn from anybody if we're humble. Yeah. Right? My, question, my final question for you guys this morning is, are you living in humility. Are you living in humility? Are you letting yourself listen to God's word? Are you letting yourself listen to the people he's placed around you? Or do you know it all already? And I wrote all those questions for myself, right? <laughs> You, or do you know it all already? Because I easily think I know it all already, right? Yeah. As we close up this morning, we're going to close up our lesson with communion. You know, and communion is a time where we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins. The sacrifice that he made so that we could go to heaven and as we take communion this morning, we'll be looking at the ultimate example of humility. The ultimate example of living for God and living for others. He is the ultimate example of living outwardly. And that's Jesus, amen? We're going to close out. I'll say a few more words and then we'll read a scripture and we'll pray for the communion. But as we take communion this morning, as we meditate, as we have this time to think, Let's remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Let's remember how he had that humility to go to the cross for your sins. How he lived for God in us by making th that decision to go to the cross. Let's think about how we can follow that example like we're called to in Philippians chapter 2. One second. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. It says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, 
who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray for the body and blood of Jesus. Dear God in heaven, just want to come before you this morning, God, and just thank you so much for sending your son to die on a cross for our sins. God, thank you so much just for being having the opportunity to really just receive your grace, God. I pray that you can be with us and help us to be able to live in humility, God, with each other and with you, that we can really live our lives ultimately for you and be able to give to others, and that we can follow Jesus' example in that, God. And I just love you so much. I pray that we can meditate on you at this time. And I love you, God. I praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.